Welcome to Module 3 of the course, Making a Lucrative Income with Your Home Studio. This module is called, How to Effectively Create Great Recordings with Your Home Studio. Now, I've been teaching for about 30 years, and I've had incredibly successful students. I teach uh, an array of different subjects, such as music theory, psychoacoustics, music production, engineering, and performance. Now, one of the main things that I teach my students when they begin with me is something called the McGurk effect. This is something that is an illusion, which is pretty fascinating, and it will affect everything you do when you're a mixing or mastering engineer, producing, um, even a songwriter with your home studio, anything to do with recording, mixing, and mastering will be greatly affected by something called the McGurk effect. And here's how it goes. I'm going to make a sound. I'm going to actually repeat that sound several times. And then we're going to take you to the next step and you'll see how this works. So here's the sound. It's just B, A, ba. Okay, I'm going to repeat that several times. So watch closely. Ba, 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 ba. Now, with the same audio, we're going to change the video only. Okay? Different picture, same exact sound. Watch very closely. Ba, 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 ba. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Here's how it works. The mind, I call it a mental mixing board, it has this way of processing sound. And when it's working with other perceptions like sight, sight takes over the driving. And no longer is your listening ability and perception in control. Sight is in control. Now watch this again. Again, I'm going to do ba first. Ba, 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 ba. We'll change the video. Same sound. Ba, 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 ba. So how does that work? Well, there have been people that have been studying the McGurk effect for 25 years, and they've done it thousands of times, and still to this day, the McGurk effect is an illusion that takes over when they, these are the researchers, are using the McGurk effect research. So this isn't something that you can kind of, you know, steal yourself against or prevent. It just happens. Now, that's just one of many illusions that occur when we mix. And this is very important when we mix in the digital age, because back in the 70s, you know, when I was in studios that had to do with analog and tape, we didn't have computer screens to look at. We didn't have much of anything to look at, some speakers, some outboard gear, VU meter, but we wouldn't stare at it like we stare at computer screens. Usually we just, you know, closed our eyes or looked at a speaker or something when we were mixing. And so I have young students, you know, from the age of 12, 16, 18. They're into EDM, they're into hip hop, they're into all these modern genres. And they're constantly asking me, how did you guys mix back then in the 70s? What did you do? And they ask me lots of questions. They're fascinated. They have these records from their fathers and their grandparents and uh, they bring the vinyl records to me and they're like, these are amazing productions. I'm say I said, yeah, they are. How was it done? I said, well, one of the things that was done then was there was no McGurk effect happening. You see? When you look at a computer screen, there's a lot more going on in your mind than you might imagine. The sights that you see are not only affecting what you hear, but you'll be taking kind of a mental picture of your session, so that when you're listening to your session later, you still see those tracks, the colors, the waveforms. You remember what problems you had, what things you had to fight with, you had to battle, and you see them. And you are not able to objectively hear your own mix. Now, one of the things that you'll be covering in this course is there's a series of music production ear training exercises. These are exercises that I've developed over the years. And some of the approaches that you'll see on this course are very interesting. They're not like other approaches that you'll see in tutorials 
or courses or mentoring anywhere else. And what I take seriously the subject of mentoring and teaching. And I've done a lot of research in music theory, psychoacoustics, production, speaker technology, and most of all, how humans react to sound. So let's take this subject of the McGurk effect and let's apply it to your own mixing right now. It's best if you close your eyes as much as possible. I've learned in my DAW, I mean, I say learn your DAW like the back of your hand. I mean, like hammer-ons, you know, are done by a heavy metal guitarist. You know, practice over and over. Practice your DAW so you know it like the back of your hand and so that you can actually manipulate many things with your eyes closed. I I've learned, you know, how to operate a lot of my plugins or different parts of my DAW and not look at the screen, but just listen with your ears. You know, there's something that I say to my students, which is use your ear, not your gear, as a priority when you're mixing. And what happens is we get deluged and we get brainwashed with a lot of myths about music production. And most of them have to do with this, putting your confidence into objects and processes rather than increasing your confidence by helping you with ear training and by helping you hear better, it's in here that you get confidence. So what happens is they'll tell you, use this speaker and your mix will sound great. Use this interface, use this microphone, use this DAW, you know, buy this plugin. I mean, plugins, I mean, <laughs> plugins are like an addiction. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? You see like $20 on sale was 200. Pfft, you get it. I have friends that have like over 500 plugins. And I asked them, how many do you use? They're like, well, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 20. And then I go watch them on their sessions. And they're using like five or six. And that's not uncommon. And there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you'll see on this course, I don't use a lot of plugins. I have clients like 20th Century Fox, the Disney Music Group, Hollywood Records. I do my work right here out of my own home studio. I have no outboard gear. I have nothing analog. And if you like analog, that's fine. But you'll see that with digital you can do anything analog can do and more analog you can't necessarily say that same thing so getting back to confidence if you're constantly told that you need this object or this process in order to have great mixes what's happening is your confidence is being sucked out of you and being placed into objects and processes and that's not a good thing your confidence will actually go down what happens when your speakers break or you have to go mix somewhere else or you can't use your interface anymore. You know, people actually like can't hear their mix objectively. And so what happens is in this course, we're going to find out how to get your confidence back into you. And it comes, it's like an onion. You got to kind of peel it. You know, it's not going to happen all at one time. Because I know if you've been around for a long time, you know, chances are you've been exposed to some of this, these myths some of this brainwashing and hopefully you know you haven't but uh, i mean i you know i still have to steel myself against some of the things that i hear out there that are just not true and just not workable so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into an actual session here and the session we're going to we're going to jump into is a mastering session now in order to become a great mixing engineer i learned something over the last 30 years if you teach someone how to master first, they will more likely become a great mixing engineer. Now, if you've been mixing for a while, don't worry. It's not like you've missed anything. You can learn mastering at any point in your career. Now, what have we been told about mastering? We've been told, well, don't try it. In fact, don't try this at home. You know, send your masters to somebody else. Get another set of ears. Get someone who's objective to listen to your, your mix. Get someone who knows what they're doing. Get one of these godlike people who are born with supernatural powers that have incredible magic rooms with magic equipment that's hundreds of thousands of dollars and all this special sound treatment because if you don't have it, you can't do it. BS. That's just another form of brainwashing and it's another lie. Truth is this, I do all my mastering here. I get, for my last, I'll, I'll tell you, my last seven projects that I did for Disney and 20th Century Fox were all accepted with no changes first time in. 
I mix them here, I master them here, right in the box, right here in my home studio. And I'm really excited to be able to share a lot of my knowledge and experience with you so that you can do the same thing in your home studio. Now, why mastering first? I teach mastering because mixing is a hundred times harder than mastering. Think about it. What's a mastering session? Usually you get a stereo file, that's one track. You put it up in your session and you have to manipulate that one track and get it to sound louder and get it to sound better. Okay? Fair enough. Mixing, you could have anywhere from eight to 200 tracks. Every one of those tracks you have to make decisions on. And then every combination of tracks have decisions that are to be made for those. In any one hour of mixing, there could be 100 to 300 major decisions made. An hour of mastering, maybe 10 or 20 decisions. So it's so interesting to me that, you know, the industry has evolved in such a way that certain myths have evolved and they, they hold true to today. So I think more and more people are, you know, beginning to find out. And anything that I can do to help, you know, clear up any of those myths and, and help you so that you can become a better mixing engineer, better mastering engineer. I mean, this course is about making a lucrative income with your home studio. One of the main ways to make a lucrative income with your home studio is to learn the truth about mixing and to develop your ear. All right, so we're going to continue, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to actually jump into a mastering session right now. This is a track. It's the theme song for the Musician's Talk Show, which is a podcast with Dallas Dwight, who's an incredible guitar player. This is the uh, track right here. That's the mix, and I have it in this mastering session. And we're going to first just take a listen to it. Um, the way that this came to me was with three stem files originally, which we'll be listening to also. The drums, the guitars, the bass. Dallas sent me those, and then he asked me to do my magic and go ahead and expand it. I think it was about a, a minute to begin with, and it's now... No, I think it was actually like 30 seconds, and it's now like a minute 48, something like that. All right, so let's take a listen to it. Here we go. All right, so that was the uh, theme song for the Musician's Talk Show with Dallas Dwight. And uh, here I want you to play for you real quick the actual stems that he sent. This is the uh, combination of three stems. Again, drums, guitars, and bass. So this is what I received 
in my home studio. He sent them, uh, you know, via internet. All right, and then we'll just take a listen to the uh, little bit of the intro again so you hear the difference. And here's what, what I came up with. So how did we get from those stems here? Well, that's what you're going to find out in this course. And we're going to take one step at a time. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, the fact that mastering itself is interesting because it used to be a linear function, you know, with tape. You had to mix first and then you had to master later. Right now, some people master while they're mixing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I personally don't. It's totally cool if you do because the whole thing is about the result. You'll see in this course why I choose to actually set up a separate session for my mastering. But uh, again, you don't have to. And even the way that I set it up, you know, this is just a tool for you to look at. It's another viewpoint. You know, the only real expert when it comes to your music is you. Uh, as far as your workflow, you know, that's something that you will decide upon for yourself. Everyone has their own preferences and things that go faster and that create higher quality for them. Because I'm under deadline a lot and I have clients that, you know, if you if you mess up on a, a job, you could be no longer working with that client. So there's a certain amount of uh, pressure and very high standards. And so I look very carefully at everything that I do in the studio in terms of speed and quality. And when we talk about quality, uh, from some of the mentors that I worked with, uh, there's some very uh, important lessons I learned. For instance, um, when you are delivering a product and you want to deliver the highest quality product, absolutely. What I learned was that part of the definition of quality is speed. So how fast you deliver that product has something to do with the quality. Like you could have a client that's, you know, he's going to enter a contest. And so the deadline is, you know, May 1st. And so you get it to him on May 1st in the morning. And you're like, I made the deadline, but he has no chance to really do any revisions, listen to it. He's not going to be very happy. Even if the, even if the track is amazing, the, you've just dropped the quality. So finding things that help you move fast and maintain quality are definitely worth learning. And hopefully I'll be able to, you know, share a lot of those things with you. I'm going to go over some of them right now. So first of all, we'll just look at how this particular mastering session is routed, how it's put together. Uh, this track right here, you know, some people put their mastering plugins right on the track, you know, right there directly, inserts, sends, whatever. I don't. What I do is I route it to a group or an AUX track. Uh, I use Cubase 9.5, Cubase 8.5, and Cubase 9. And um, in these particular DAWs, uh, the AUX is sometimes called a group channel. So I, I route it to a group channel. And here I'm using Isotope Ozone 4. Isotope, uh, you know, I mean, I think they're up to like uh, 7 or 8 right now. And they have all kinds of... Uh, improvements that they've made to their plugin. One of the things that you find amongst uh, A-list mixing and mastering engineers is that, you know, when they're being interviewed, when they're on the tutorials, when they're, and many times they're sponsored by different 
uh, companies. And by the way, I, I used to be sponsored by several companies and I actually decided not to be anymore because as I taught more and more, uh, I looked at the fact that even I started leaning towards saying certain things because I was getting free gear from people. It's kind of hard not to. And teaching is a real big part of my life, so I decided not to have any sponsorships. I try to, I try, you know, to create a very fair presentation, the good, the bad, and the ugly, when I'm talking about any gear or any process. So isotope ozone is a really good very good mastering suite. It's a suite because it has several uh, plugins within it. Here it has an equalizer, there's reverb, there's a limiter, maximizer, harmonic exciter, uh, there's a multi-band dynamics, which is compressor, and a multi-band stereo imaging for widening your mix. And you don't have to use them all necessarily on every track. In fact, they have here, I'm going to go to the other one so I can change the settings because I've locked in that one. There's different defaults and factory presets. So here you have these, all these different factory presets. There's a lot of them. Look at this. Okay. So you can go through and you can audition these things. In fact, we're going to do that. And when you're auditioning, so let's take a listen to this track, actually not master, just the mix. And here's the master. Mix. Master. Okay, so you can see the difference there. Now, let's take a look inside this particular plugin. We're going to go here. There's one called Gentle Tube. Instrumental with slow dynamics. Reduce lows and highs. I'll just go through several more without even saying the name so you can just listen. So you can see that mastering can really drastically change the character of your track. Um, it's not as, you know, deep as mixing in terms of how much you can change that track, but it's surprising the amount you can change the character of a track and what you can do with it. Um, you know, some people send their mixes to mastering engineers and expect uh, miracles from something that cannot be done. You know, the mix needs to be solid. The way that I explain to my students is this. If you were working in like the Ford Motor Company factory on the assembly line, making Mustangs, and your job was to sand the bodies before they got painted. So you went in every day and you sanded these things and all the different seams from the welding and it went on to the painter. Well, you're like the mixing engineer and the painter's like the mastering engineer. The trouble with how we're taught and mentored and educated as mixing engineers is that we never go talk to the painter and watch them work and get mentored by them. So that's one of the things that you're going to benefit from in this course, which will help you, you know, create a lucrative home studio. Because if you can master right away, you have another income stream. But even more important than that to me is this is that you'll become a much better mixing engineer and your confidence will increase that much more. 
So let's say you were that sander and you went over to the painter and the painter ends up telling you things like this. He says, you know, you guys send me these, these bodies, you know, these car bodies for me to paint. And you know that seam on the top? You know that big weld seam? And they're like, yeah. Um, you know, I don't ever really have a problem with that. That's not a big deal. It's the one on the hood. You know, it's the one on the hood. It's that little seam in the middle. It's like, I always have to end up sanding it more, like 10, 15 minutes more. And they're like, well, why don't you tell us? Why don't you send it back? I'm under too much pressure. I just need to do it, you know. And then the sander goes, well, that's weird because my boss told me that I need to sand the top like for like 20 minutes at least and make sure that I can feel it and make sure that if I can feel any bumps, then, you know, then it's going to show up in the paint job. And the one on the hood, he said, just, you know, go over it for three minutes or something and, you know, see, you know, he'll say that that one doesn't require any big deal and it'll look fine. And the painter looks at it and he goes, that's like totally the opposite of what I need. So that's an example of how the mixing and mastering processes interact and how much we've been out of communication and out of touch with each other. So that's why I'm starting this course here with mastering. Because it, you, we're like in the painter shop right now. And I'm going to show you what happens in the mastering end that affects your product. That way you can figure out and you can realize things about mixing. Say, oh, I shouldn't do that when I mix. Or I should do that. All right. So let's take a look now at the suite itself. I'm going to tell you one thing about plugins and how they name these factory presets. You know... I hope someday all plugins will just number them and not name them. And I'll tell you why. You know, the McGurk effect, uh, that's just one of many mental illusions that happen. One of them is this. If you give a factory preset of a plugin a name, a person's going to hear it that way. Like if you say strong mid-range tape saturation, they're going to hear their mid-range go up. And so, you know what's interesting? L look at this. I just saw this. The, the high end of the mid-range is up, but over here, it's actually coming down a little bit. So they've named it for whatever reason they've named it. But even more important than this is this. When they name them things like country mastering or hip-hop, which they do in this, this plugin. Take a look here. They have uh, country master, drum and bass, hip-hop master, electronica master, jazz master, pop master, reggae, rock. I see that and I cringe, and I'll tell you why. I've many times started out with a factory preset that was hip hop on a orchestral piece. The reason for it is this: every single track that you work on is unique. Like, like a, you know, they say a snowflake. There are no two that are alike. Most people want to uh, address their mixing and their mastering like a car wash. They want to know, when you master, what do you do on your high end? When you master, what do you do here? When you master, what do you do there? When you master, what do you do here? And they want to take notes and say, okay, when I master, I'm going to do this. Or when you do your vocals, how do you EQ it? Every singer, every song, every vocal track, every mix, every master is unique. And you don't know what's going to work. You really don't. You can have a good idea. But the only way to find out is to listen to it. And that's, again, why I say, you know, use your ear, not your gear, as a priority when you're mixing and mastering. So long story short, many times I've used, like, the wrong um, factory preset for the wrong genre, and it sounds awesome, right? So these are, what this means is somebody on one track of drum and bass, set this mastering chain up and it sounded awesome on that track. That doesn't mean it's going to sound awesome on every drum and bass track. All right? I think I made my point. Okay. Now, we're going to let this thing go. We're on, what was this, this particular preset? And we're going to just take a look inside and see what's happening.
So that's your EQ. Reverb. Pretty wild. Your loudness maximizer. You hear it distorting? That's too much. Harmonic exciter. This adds some richness, and some depth. Here's the high end. Here's the low end. Compressor. You can really squash it. That's the low end. Here's the middle. High end. Now notice, we're doing these adjustments on an entire mix. It's not hard. You just have to listen. And the most important thing, and the biggest thing that hopefully you'll take away from this course is what we're about to look at now. And this is how to avoid flying blind when you're mixing or mastering. I would say, just from my own networking and teaching and dealing in the industry for the last 30 years, I would say probably at least, at least 75 to 80% of mixing engineers and mastering engineers um, are, that work from home studios are flying blind. And here's how not to, okay? Now, I've brought in a reference track to AB. AB means to compare. Some people think, you know, A to B. Some people think that A being means to match. You're trying to match something. And this is an important distinction to make. A being is not necessarily matching something. You're comparing. You may have a track, like I have a track as a reference track for this one. It's important to get something similar to what you're A being. The whole philosophy of A being is to have apples and apples so that you can make a good comparison and not be totally off mark on what you're doing. So up to that point, you know, when you find your reference track, you then want to compare, you want to hear what you like about that reference track. There might be something you don't like. You might like everything about it, but you don't like the snare. It's not cracking enough. So you're going to compare, and when you're A being with your track, you're going to make your snare compare louder than that one. You're not going to try to match it necessarily, all right? Now, this technique I'm about to show you, again, A being is like the one thing. If you learn it, your mixes will go, like the quality are going to improve like crazy. Every student I've ever had when I show them this, you know, after that, their careers take off. So listen close if you want a lucrative home studio right now. All right. So let's listen to this reference track. Now, because of licensing, copyright law, and all that, you know, to put a course like this together and to have it publicly viewed, um, uh, and I abide very closely to all copyright laws, and, you know, I respect the value of what we do, and I buy all my music and no crack programs, and I suggest the same for you, besides the fact of all the computer trouble you can have. So, uh, what I did, which is kind of cool, I just uh, submitted a track and the first draft was approved for a car commercial with an agency. And it was very similar to this particular style. So we're going to actually use that as an AB. And here's the reference track. Let's take a listen to it.
So on that track, I was asked to put, you know, rock and orchestral elements together with some energy. And so it just so happened that, you know, this particular theme song uh, for the podcast also calls for, you know, some rock energy and orchestration stuff. So when you're A-being, I discovered something very important. When you're comparing your track to a reference track, anytime that there's silence in between A and B, or any movement whatsoever, a mouse click, uh, you know, moving something, pushing a button, the mental mixing board, you know, the mind's mixing board, uh, it has a way of altering what you're hearing, just like the McGurk effect. And this is something that, uh, so, so A being itself is an incredible tool. Now, A being with what I call checkerboard A being takes you to a whole new level, and I'll show you how. So what I did was I basically took, I'll show you here, I took my mix over here, and I duplicated it, and I stuck it over here, and then I put the reference track right on top of it on another track here, and uh, I highlighted them, and I just sliced them, you know, with a tool, you know, like this, okay? And... Now what we can do since they're sliced, they're five second slices, just random. So now I'm muting every other one above and below and creating like a checkerboard. Okay, I'm gonna highlight that, set my left and right locators, and then we're gonna run a, a loop here. And here's what's key about this. And this is incredible because you can, with a checkerboard AB, Sit back, which I encourage you to do. I, I like to sit on my couch in the studio or I walk around. I'll even go outside the door. And that's a very important place to go when you're checking your mixes and masters is to close the door and literally listen outside the door. The reason for that is when you're inside a room and there's speakers in that room, there are so many, uh, no matter how much sound treatment you have, you're getting direct sound in a space and it's different, it's a different experience than listening to those same uh, frequencies and the same sound source through a wall or a door. It has a way of separating things out more clearly, and you can hear the separation of your mix. Also can hear the, the low end pretty interesting that way too. So what I'll do is I'll walk around and I'll just loop my checkerboard AB and it'll play A, B, see like this. You'll just play A, then B, then A, then B, A, B, etc. And there will not be any moments of silence. There won't be any movement at all. And so therefore, this change, this, this, this illusion that occurs in the mind from the mind's mixing board never goes into effect. You can actually objectively listen to your mix or your master with another reference track and compare precisely and objectively what's there. I'll show you what I mean. So let's listen to this checkerboard AB. There's A. Right into B, etc. Now, it's funny because I never changed the uh, plugin. Let's go to it on the mastering. I was fooling around with those settings before. I'm going to go to the setting that I chose because I definitely heard a difference there. I don't know if you heard it. It's good to listen to this course with headphones, by the way, if you can. Um, then you can get some of the nuances. So I heard there like kind of just lots of mid-range and kind of uh, a little tinny stuff, not so warm. Now let's listen to it now with the setting that I chose. And I'm also going to do something here. We're going to set up an RMS meter. Well, it'll also show peak meter, but there'll be an RMS meter. Let's talk about this before we listen to the checkerboard again. An RMS meter, RMS stands for root mean squared. It's like an average. It shows the average of the loudness level as the track progresses. Uh, different meters take different 
chunks of time, like maybe five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever, and it averages those. Peak meter, you'll see moving around like crazy because it's taking every single peak, like every instant, immediate, and it's showing how loud every immediate sound is. So it moves very fast. But that's not how a human hears loudness. The perception of loudness is averaged over time with the human ear. An RMS meter is a good approximation of how a human hears, but it's not exact. Uh, a VU meter, you know, back in the day, and some people still bring them up, uh, it's not a bad idea to use because it's more like a RMS. It's an, more of an average, and it more approximates the ear and the mind. Now, you remember the loudness wars? Well, they're pretty much over, you could say, in some respects. In some places, they're still like, they're, they're raging, but mostly they're under control. And if you look at the RMS, let's just, I'm gonna run this track and then I'm gonna explain something to you about metering when you're mastering. So if, let's just run the track and just kind of listen to A and B and A and B, and we can look over here at the meter. The uh, bottom part of that meter is the RMS, it'll move slower and the top part of that meter is the peak. It'll move much faster. Let's just take a look. Okay, so you'll see that um, there was a, a bluish color in the bottom, greenish on the top. The bottom, again, was the RMS. And let's take a look at what the average RMS is of these tracks. And we're, right now we're using the meter, okay? One of the few times that I'll tell you to use your eyes is when looking at your RMS meter while mastering. So one of the only times where it becomes important. Uh, other than that, I encourage you always to use your ear. In fact, even with this process we're doing here, I'm gonna show you how I use the meter to get into range and then use the ear to really dial in. You'll see what I mean. So let's just take a look at the average RMS here. So it's somewhere there between this is called minus 10, you have zero at the top, minus 10, minus 11, minus 12. There's a softer section of the song, there's the louder. Somewhere between 10 and 12. So somewhere between 10 and 12 on the, on the loud section. During the loudness wars, tracks were going up here. Uh, and when I'm telling you about RMS and I'm saying minus, let's go over this again. Zero is the top of the scale for digital recording. Um, it's the pretty much loudest you can go with digital. And once you go louder than that, it starts clipping and distorting. Then you have minus one, minus two, minus 10, all the way down here to minus 60. And below that, you can hardly hear it, so soft. So the larger the number, the softer the track, the, the lower the volume is. So when we say between minus 10 and minus 12 dB RMS, dB meaning decibel, which is a unit of loudness. So between minus 10 and minus 12, that would be minus 10 being the loudest, minus 12 being softer, so in that range. During the loudness wars back, you know, like, it, it kind of got the worst in a, maybe 2015, 2014, and uh, it actually started to improve a bit since then. But tracks were going up to uh, like minus six, minus five. And when you have a track that loud, you might ask, well, I thought you can go to zero before it'll distort. Well, it's true if you have like just a single sound, you know, like a voice or a guitar or something like that. But when you start packing lots of sounds together, and you get them up here in this range, they become so dense that you can experience some distortion under zero. 
like you'll hear it. So you, you'll never really see a track mastered at zero. I mean, maybe somebody did, you know, but even today, I mean, there are some people still that like, you know, with some EDM tracks or some, oh, like heavy metal, you know, some tracks are going up now to minus six, you know, minus six, even up towards five still. They're becoming rare though, thank God. Because what happens is when you pack all that sound into this much space uh, as far as loudness, it just, the only way you can do it is you have to compress it. You can't let anything like a snare drum stick out or a kick drum stick out or a cymbal crash stick out or a loud guitar or a real like, like where the singer really like lets go and goes real loud. You have to push all those loud things down, which is what compression does. Compression lowers the volume of louder sounds. Now, if you compress a lot, it starts to sound really squished. Let's take a, let's take a listen to what that would sound like. So if I took this track and I'm just going to slap a compressor on here and we're going to hit play. Now, if I turn it up, it'll get louder but it's, everything's squashed. Like this, watch, I'll do it even more. Look at how this is hardly moving. It's like staying in the same position. Everything's kind of squashed down to the same thing. Look what happens when I take the compression off of it. There's more what's called dynamic range. The louds are louder and the softs are a little softer. There's a difference between loud and soft and people feel emotion when they hear dynamic range. And we'll go into this in more detail. This video here is I'm presenting the whole world of mastering to you and I really want you to, to dive in and I want you to, to really take to heart what I'm going over and start practicing these things. You know, I'm going to give you some actual exercises. A lot of this course has to do with music production ear training exercises. Because as I said, I'm not here to tell you to use this particular plug-in or, or particular speaker, microphone, whatever. You know, really the best mixers, you know what they say? Behind the scenes when they're not being interviewed, they're say, they'll say, I don't really care what I'm using as long as it's working. I don't know. Give me a mic. You'll say, what mic? You know, this is when they're, you know, behind the scenes. I'll say, what do you got? Just bring it over here. Uh, and they don't, they don't say like, only bring me this mic or only let me use this. I can't mix here on these speakers. These are KRK Rocket 5s. I can't mix on this. Well, I do. And I make a good living and I have some corporate clients. So it's not about the speaker. It's about your ear training and referencing so you're not flying blind. All right, so let's take a look, a listen to the checkerboard AB with the setting that I had. As we listen, the most important thing there is with ABing is matching volume levels. Don't do it with the meter. You can get it into range, but don't rely on the meter to tell you how loud something is. Use your ear. So that's really the first ear training, the first music production ear training exercise, is go ahead and set up some checkerboard ABs like this and use your ear to dial in the loudness and just listen very carefully and feel the energy. It's a, there's energy you know, coming out of those speakers and don't rely on the, on the meter. Again, you can use it to, to dial in at the beginning, but then you finish it up with your ear. So here we go. OK. 
Okay. So I had set that up prior. We have an apple and an apple. And that's the most important thing about a being. What it does is it allows you to not fly blind. You could be really way off. I mean, you know, I speak to some of the top mastering engineers in LA. And again, this is things I'd never heard them say in a tutorial or in an interview. But, you know, I'm at lunch with them and they'll tell me. I'll say, uh, you know, I kind of, I was even, like there was this one tutorial I saw with this mastering engineer. I went and had lunch with them. And I said, uh, do you ever you know, use references or, or A, B? Because I never heard them mention it. So I didn't want to really like jump into the subject. And they said, they leaned over, they go, I can't survive without it. You know how I do it? And I'm like, how? Well, you know, my car, I bought my car last year. Uh, it's not a new car. And I could buy a new car, but I didn't. You know why I bought this used car? And I'm like, why? Because it has a CD player in it. You know why? And I'm like, why? Because when I'm done for the day, I make a CD with a reference track on it and with a track I'm using that I'm working on, and I listen to it all the way home. And when I get home, I take notes, and I go back to work the next day. Absolutely, I A-B. And I'm like, wow, that was so refreshing for me to hear. So don't think that this is a crutch. It's actually helping your ears the more you do it. It's keeping your ears finely tuned, and it's keeping you from flying blind. It helps save time. It helps create an environment in your home studio where you can actually make a lucrative income. So those are the things I wanted to cover mostly in this section of Module 3, which was introduce you to the McGurk effect, and then introduce you to mastering and show you how important mastering is, and then the vital importance of A being. So we'll move on now.